But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast. Today, we're plunging into the epic saga of Montezuma II, the last emperor of the almighty Aztec Empire. Imagine wandering the vibrant streets of Tenochtitlan, a city of marvels that stood at the heart of an empire, a wing even its conquerors with its splendor. In this episode, we're unraveling how Montezuma forged an empire through strategic alliances and fierce battles. We'll take you through the intricate tapestry of Aztec life, their profound beliefs, elaborate ceremonies, and the roles of rituals in their society. But hold on to your hats, because things heat up with the arrival of Hernan Cortes and his band of Spanish adventurers. It's a story of colliding worlds filled with intrigue, diplomacy, and betrayal. As we draw to a close, we'll ponder Montezuma's lasting impact and how the fall of this great empire reshaped the history of the Americas. So join us as we bring history to motion. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast, where today we're heading to North America and specifically to Mexico and to a time before Europeans have actually arrived on the continent. And there was a great empire known as the Aztecs who were running the show in Mexico led by a great emperor named Montezuma. And the reason we know more about Montezuma than anybody else from the Aztec Empire is because he's the one who meets Cortes and the Spanish conquistadors and goes from being the most powerful man, maybe on the continent, to having his entire empire and 80 to 90 percent of his people dead from disease and war in a matter of decades, if not by the end of the century. So this is an exciting one because I think we know this story from the Spanish point of view and the biases that come with that and from kind of a European mindset and how the Spanish want to twist this story. But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Montezuma and the Aztecs and try to put ourselves into their shoes, take their cultural norms, kind of see what they're seeing and try to tell a story around that. And then next time we'll come back and we'll do the reverse and we'll take a look at Cortez and the Spanish conquistadors, kind of bring them together into what they were seeing when they showed up in Mexico. Yeah, I think it's it's such an interesting way to do it. And I'm glad we're approaching it this way because I think history can often seem like it's there's this duality of those who are acting and then those who are being acted upon, right? You know, those parties that may not come off as having agency. But I, I that definitely doesn't do, you know, historical analysis any justice because if you look at the Aztecs, you know, the city of gold, this is one of the largest empires, you know, at this point in history in terms of how large it is. And it could probably compete with some of the other major empires across the globe at this point in time. So to just kind of write them off as these agents without any real power or direct control of of their realm or environment is very short sighted. And I think it it leads it leaves a lot on the table in terms of analysis and just kind of understanding what's going on and what really played out in this in this clash of civilization that would you know ultimately unfold i love the way you put that because we really do look at it like that we see the spanish and their objectives when it comes to colonization and obsession over finding gold to you know bring their empire into you know levels that would never be seen but we just see the aztecs of kind of that footnote of the spanish showed up the aztecs surrendered and the rest is history but there's so much more that happens there with the aztecs and all of the indigenous communities around them. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of talk a lot about that today because I think that's where the true story comes into play. Kind of just really excited about this story. And we chatted a little bit before we started recording on how we both got pretty deep into this story. And throughout this week and, and next episode, this might be my favorite story when it comes to anything we've studied in history. There's just so much going on and so much happening in such a short period of time. And you're dealing with these you know characters who are incredibly ambitious, pretty crazy, <laughs> but also 
completely different. And it kind of turns into a science fiction type of story where the Spanish and the Aztecs are almost like aliens from different planets when they look at each other, just how different they are technologically, culturally, the way they dress, the way they do everything. And then it's just these clashes of massive, massively different civilizations at very different points in their history. So it gets together into this really, really, you know, I guess I should say it goes as well as you think it would go if you've seen enough <laughs> movies. But um, there's a lot more here than just, you know, the Spanish rolling in and kind of steamrolling the Aztecs and, and taking taking over. There's there's way more levels we're going to get to. So I think it's going to be a good one today. Yeah, I, I think the part about this particular narrative or narratives like this, you know, these kind of uh, first contact narratives that we, you know, often jump into when we're talking about colonization or discovery of the new world. You know, for me personally, it kind of brings up this almost like childlike imagination of these two sets of people meeting each other and like you know alien i think is a good word because they probably couldn't be more you know diametrically opposed in terms of how their societies are run or you know how they look and communicate with each other like i couldn't imagine and i think this is the part that i enjoy the most is you know stepping foot on an unknown land to be met with you know a massive civilization that is organized you know has their cultural and religious ceremonies so deeply entrenched within their world like i, I you know it, it it's almost leaves you speechless because it would be so jarring in terms of you know the world that you're coming from and the ideas and beliefs that you're bringing over you're right in the sense that it's it's everything is so so different but what i love at this story is we get the human elements still come back to it family is very important religion is the number one thing to the aztecs and it's the number one thing to the spanish and we'll even get into it where the aztecs kind of make jokes about every time the spanish show up they roll their eyes and go here we go they're going to do their whole god speech again about how great their lord is and we get it you've said it a million times and so it, it's funny because they they see their gods being so integral to their to their lives, but how they worship, what they believe in, their overall cultural structures are also very different. So we'll get into a lot of that. But I, I think, yeah, this is going to be a, an interesting one as we kind of bring into the fold two very, very different civilizations and, and really, you know, first contact with two proper empires who have never even come in contact with anybody from the same continent before. So let's try to get into the Aztecs and, and who they come from. And so I think the biggest misconception that everybody has is we call when we think of Aztecs, we would say, oh, they are indigenous peoples. That is a very European mindset. When we look at the Aztecs, the Aztecs were not indigenous to Mexico in the same way that the Mayans were, for example, the Aztecs at the time of the Spanish arrival had only been there for about two, three hundred years. The Aztecs, in fact, are conquerors who originated from areas what we think is somewhere in California, southern, south, southwest of the United States. And they were nomadic people who started to move south and eventually found their way into Mexico. And throughout that time were conquerors. They were invaders. They took a lot of land and really set their foothold in the kind of the heart of Mexico. And they did so by being very good at war, but also very smart politically. They would marry into uh, wealthy families and powerful families from the indigenous tribes that were already there and were able to assert their power um, across Mexico. And, you know, Aztec is a name that kind of comes a little bit later on, but they were actually, if they were to, if you were to ask them what they were called, they called themselves the Mexica people, which is where the name Mexico f- comes from. So they are Again, picking the name of the territory and everything kind of comes from the Aztecs, but they are really relative newcomers to Mexico. So I think it's an important thing to say, yes, they're indigenous from a European standpoint. But if you ask surrounding tribes, they hate the Aztecs. They have they want every opportunity to to get back at them because they are, again, like they're invaders. They've they've taken slaves. They've done all of these sort of things. And so when the Europeans show up, there's a lot of tribes in that area and a lot of different groups of people who are very, very happy to join in with the Spanish and fight back against the Aztecs because, again, the Aztecs are conquerors. They're not the indigenous people of that area. And I guess we could say the true indigenous people, based on the time frames that maybe we're looking at, not big fans of the Aztecs. So it's an important thing that we need to set down there before we we move on. And I think that's a tactic, right, that you see in a lot of colonizing missions. If we look back to other episodes, especially if we're talking like the pre-colonial era, you often see these kind of weird alliances kind of manifest over this, uh, you know, colonization experiment where, you know, 
know, colonizers are able to divide and conquer or create or create bigger wedges of those that already exist between quote unquote indigenous people, uh, between tribes. You know, I think if you look at Canadian history, for example, you know, how the French and the English were able to use indigenous tribes against one another and kind of create this divisiveness around them. So, you know, it is a pretty common tactic that I think, you know, is a, it probably runs through most of these colonizing stories. Absolutely. And it's, I think, a mistake we make a lot of times when we look at history, we see, even when we say the Spanish, the Spanish weren't yeah. aligned. When we get into Cortez next next time, we'll see the, the rifts that happened with the conquistadors. And most of the conquistadors have pretty terrible endings to their lives. They fall out with each other. They're always fighting over this and that. And so they're not even unified. What makes us think that everybody who's on this continent is is unified? They're very fractured as well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's something we're going to see a lot. And it's a common trope that, oh, well, the conquistadors showed up with 300 men and took over this Aztec empire, okay. which is not not true in the slightest. They were, you know, they would be outnumbered 10 to 1 sometimes with their indigenous allies because they were fighting against the Aztecs and a lot of people were ready to sign up. So it's an important distinction um, to make, but I think we've done a pretty good job of, of kind of setting that. So the Aztecs have moved into Mexico and they've set up, some say might be the greatest city that's ever been created. The Spanish, when they arrive, are almost like jaws are hitting the floor when they see the city, which is today where Mexico City is sitting. And it was built in this like marshy area in the middle of a lake. And so some of the Europeans said, hey, I've been to Venice and it's very similar to how Venice is built with its canals and causeways and all of these sort of things. But over the years, that lake was basically drained. And so now if you go to Mexico City, which is not in the middle of a lake, but that's where the city was today. So there's a lot of areas in Mexico where you could say like, yeah, that's where Cortez met Montezuma and that's where this battle happened, but it's the middle of an apartment block or something like that. Yeah. It's not a lake anymore, which I think is a little sad because I would have loved to to see what the city is. But now you have Mexico City has grown into this really great city in, in its own sense and completely different to what it was, you know, five centuries ago. So the way this city was is kind of constructed is there's, they say almost maybe 200,000 people living in this city, maybe a million people in the surrounding area. And to put that into perspective, that's massive by 1500 standards. This isn't, you know, we say today a million people, okay, that's a pretty big city. But back then that's talking, you know, biggest cities in the world, you know, yep. thinking of London and Paris and Constantinople and in these great places. So they've built this great city and it's quite modern. And in the sense of not so much technologically as we'll get, we'll get into, but culturally, economically, um, there's a lot of philosophy going on there. The, the Aztecs are not dumb people. They're actually quite smart people. However, they just haven't been a sitting in a city for long enough to really have the technological innovation that their European or Asian counterparts um, would have. But some of the things that you would see within the Aztec culture was they took chocolate admiration. To an unbelievable level. <laughs> they believe that cacao was given to them by the gods, which is the basically the base ingredient of chocolate. So very similar to how the Mayans were in that same sense. Um, they enjoyed caffeinated drinks, spiced chocolate beverages. They also um, used the cacao beans sometimes as currency to buy food. And in some cases, it was considered more valuable than gold just because gold was actually not that rare in Mexico. They use it as more of an upper class extravagance um, and kind of if you had the ability to have more chocolate and kind of use it in your, um, your diet and all these sort of things, you were kind of seen as being a little bit more upper class, but it was definitely something that the lower classes enjoyed when they could as well. And Montezuma allegedly drank gallons of chocolate every day for energy and is an aphrodisiac because why not and um apparently would he would use it to give to his military to kind of keep them on board so yeah it's a it's an interesting thing so if you like chocolate you can thank the aztecs and the mayans for for bringing this you know to the world but it's just an interesting thing where as a european coming over you're seeing this something completely different that you've never seen before this is just kind of some of these similar things simpler things i guess in life that we take for granted today that was this just absolutely f fundamentally important thing to Aztec culture. It almost reminds me of like what would probably, you know, a little bit after this become like the sugar craze that would happen in Europe, right? Like that yeah. almost obsession and fetishization of, of sugar and it being used up, you know, in the upper and up middle and upper middle classes and, you know, the higher elites who would use sugar and adorn it with everything possible that they could it's so interesting you know i think it goes back to your point of like the human element so 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 different but yet so remarkably similar at the same time yeah it's like the upper class in france yeah. drinking their 
fancy wines, but in Mexico, they're having their fancy chocolate drinks. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. Yeah. And yeah. it's, it's lovely to see just because again, it comes back to the, the human story that we have here. And one of the other things too, is with this city was apparently it was quite new because it had only been around for a few hundred years. So it really didn't have that, like think of the dirtiness that you would think of of a large European city. But when it comes to its scale, some of the Europeans even said like, look, I've been to Rome, I've been to Constantinople, and this is on the same level, if not larger than what we're seeing. So I think we have to really set this down that this city is maybe the biggest city in the world, if not, you know, in the top one or two. And it is, you know, it looks like a paradise. It's very green. The Aztecs love to keep songbirds as pets. Yeah. So you're walking down the, the streets and you're hearing maybe a little bit of a, a little bit of a racket, but you're also hearing lovely songs all the time that are coming through. And Montezuma was known for keeping a lot of pets. He had a, a zoo actually within the um within the city. And one of the funny things I like about the Spanish description of the zoo is they're like, Yeah, they had these types of animals and we saw lions and we saw tigers, and then you stop and you think and you go, Wait, lions and tigers are there's no lions and tigers in North America. The lions are an <laughs> animal. But probably jaguars or something that was was yeah. native that they're making you know mixing up, but just you know some of those sort of things that they like to do. So you know it is a very very beautiful place. But the Aztecs are not. I don't want to paint them as they're super nice guys. They're they're doing everything. They're very peaceful or anything like that. They're an extremely violent empire, like any empire was. Yeah. And I don't think we should say they're. We can put them on a ranking and say they're more or less violent. They controlled by fear. They invaded lands that were near them. They would be very savvy politically, where they would find ways to infiltrate different areas to to kind of bend them to their will and, and really just expand their empire like any empire that we've ever seen. So this is now the crown jewel of the, the Americas at this point. And when it comes to leadership, this is where I think it'd be a good time to introduce Montezuma because he's got to keep all of this together. He's got this beautiful place. He's yep. got this pretty tight control over his empire. But like anything, I think he's probably worried about that they, you know, what's going on in the Mayan empire. Is there any other tribes that are going to cause some issues or internal challenges. I don't really think he's considering what I'm going to call an, an alien invasion of, <laughs> of an epic proportions that he's going to see um, not too long. But I think it's good to maybe introduce him and get to know him a little bit better before we we talk about his, his first contact. Yeah. And I think it's such a great point you made, Paul. Empires are inherently violent, right? What does an empire come down to? It's the ability to enact authority over others. And I think, you know, maybe it just by way of the current environment, that we live in and the content that we consume, you know, the Aztecs are painted as a very violent culture and, and, you know, rightfully so, I think based on what we've learned and what we'll talk about, hard to debate otherwise, but I don't think they're any more or less violent than any other empire that we've discussed previously or we'll discuss later. Violence takes different forms. And I think that's probably just something to like something really good to keep in mind. Just, you know, if you're learning about history or trying to understand all these different factors at play, violence can look very different depending on where you are in the world. But, you know, context is what is obviously king at the end of the day that it kind of really is able to kind of drive this home. Absolutely. And I think no, no empire is knocking on their neighbor's door and saying, you know, can we hey. take over? <laughs> yeah. Would you like to join your empire? They're like, you know what? That's such a great idea. Let's come and join us. And then no empire emperor is sitting there and his the people around him are saying like, oh, you know what? You didn't invade the local town and you didn't bring riches and make our economy better. That's okay. You can, you can, you can relax and we can just live nice and peacefully. There's always someone at their throat who's pushing them to do more and they're always exactly. wanting to need to keep expanding for defensive purposes to save your own skin and again the aztecs are like the romans they're like the chinese they're like any any empire that exists um and so yeah i think you, you kind of hit the nail on the head this is inherently what they are as empires and this is just part of the human story that we sell exactly so if we kind of pivot back to montezuma so I'll, we'll kind of jump into his life and then you know we'll try to ground it in the broader context of what we're talking about leading up to the point of contact uh with uh you know with uh with the spanish conquistadors so montezuma the second he was born in 1466 1466 you know it's i always love these dates because they just always take me back to you know how far away we are from the present day but again in the 
the grand scheme of things, it's a snap of the fingers. And, you know, he really was a central figure in the in like this kind of pre-Columbian history of the Americas. Uh, particularly, you know, if we're talking about specifics, he's the ninth emperor of the Aztec Empire. His full name, which I'm going to try to pronounce, and I hope no one lambasts me for it, but Montezuma II Oxayotzin, which translates to angry like a lord. And apparently this is supposed to reflect his very powerful and commanding presence as a ruler. You might be wondering, how did I figure out how to pronounce that word? I actually found this great website that actually is able to, you know, you can put it in and it'll translate it and pronounce it in the dialect that you're looking for. That's the only word I did it for because as as Paul, as you probably know, there are some names here that I would be ashamed to keep butchering throughout throughout the throughout this episode. <laughs> well, I think you did pretty good considering there's a there's a lot of X's and consonants yes. in, yeah. in in those words. But um, yeah, I think it's it. You know, we got to try our best where we can. Exactly. Yeah, we got to do our best. And I think with Montezuma, there's definitely some sentiments that I think really came out to me. But in his early life, you know, he was deeply entrenched in this environment of Aztec royalty. You know, he played a crucial role in shaping you know, his future as a leader and warrior. So he's obviously born in 1466. He's born to an emperor. Um, his father is an emperor. His mother is a queen. And he's kind of nurtured in this atmosphere where political power and military prowess are highly valued. So you can already kind of see, you know, the early, you know, seeds of, you know, being groomed to be this excellent leader are kind of already set the foundation. So his father, um, he was an Aztec emperor who kind of contributed significantly to the expansion and consolidation of the Aztec empire. He was known for his diplomatic skills and strategic marriages, which helped strengthen Aztec alliances and, you know, continue to expand their territories. His mother, uh, was, who was, who was the queen at the time, uh, her lineage and role in the household would also kind of provide this stable and culturally rich environment for the young prince. Um, he had three siblings. Each of them, you know, played a key role in his upbringing. They offered him a unique perspective on, you know, governance, milita military strategy, religious practices. Uh, one of his siblings, you know, in particular is known for his influence on Aztec politics and religion. And, you know, a lot of historians think it's plausible that many of Montezuma's ideas and actions were influenced by many of his, uh, his, his siblings as he kind of grew up and kind of ascended to power. And I was looking into like education and training because I know, you know, typically when we do, you know, you know, European or Western leaders kind of cut and dry, you know, humanities, they went to college, they went to school. This is, this is, this is very interesting to learn about. But for Montezuma, you know, he received a comprehensive education designed for future leaders. His education included like rigorous military training, studies in governance, history, religion, and possibly you know, it's assumed or inferred based on what we know about the Aztecs, astronomy and other sciences. You know, obviously these aspects were crucial to, you know, the Aztec culture as a whole. And obviously, you know, as we know, they placed a high value on military and religious leadership. So Monte Montezuma's education, you know, obviously would have focused on preparing him for his future roles as a warrior, a priest, and an emperor. I think it goes back to how we talked about that you could plug in any sort of empire in history and you just described a Roman emperor, a Chinese right. emperor. It's the same thing, right? It's value on military. And it's always funny, right? We talk about these great empires. There's always a military tradition in some capacity, because if you're not trying to kick everyone else's butt, you're probably going to get your own butts kicked. Exactly. And then, you know, looking at astronomy, which we'll get into the religious elements and how important that is. And there's, again, like the Aztecs were very far advanced when it came to astronomy and to some of those other types of sciences. And Again, they want him to be a good leader. They understand the, the importance of being able to govern this empire and bring it to the level that they need it to get to. So again, yeah, he's like a typical emperor, just in a different part of the world, speaking a different language and having some unique cultural elements that we'll get into. But, you know, he's no different than than many other emperors that we'll come across in, in future episodes and in previous episodes. And I think that's the cool part about doing these episodes, right? Especially when you when you think we're doing something so different relative to what we usually do or what usually is discussed. And you're like, oh, this is going to be crazy to learn about, you know, the Aztecs and the Mayans and the Incas and, and Montezuma who led, you know, this great civilization. I can't wait to see how different it is. And obviously there's aspects which are significantly different. But to your point, if you genericize that a bit, you'd be hard pressed to tell me where in the world this is taking place. 100%. He's uh, he's in, an emperor in training, really. And that's yeah, the, exactly. the standard yeah. playbook. Yeah. yeah. So we can kind of jump to his ascension to power. Um, so his ascension to the throne in 1502 was a significant event in Aztec history. So it, 
essentially marked the continuation of this powerful dynasty. He succeeded his uncle, who was also a renowned military leader and had also greatly expanded the Aztec Empire. And he inherited this inheritance set the stage for Montezuma's two decade reign, during which he would continue to demonstrate his, his exceptional military and administrative capabilities. You know, he was on the right side of this inheritance. You know, he did inherit a very, very strong empire. Um, essentially, it was at its zenith, you know, thanks to uh, his uncle and his father's successful military campaigns and strategic alliances. Um, it had seen significant territorial territorial expansion and its capital, uh, Tenochtitlan, had become a major urban center of, center of power and culture in Mesoamerica. So this strong foundation provided Montezuma with essentially a very solid base from which he could kind of govern and further expand the empire. And I think we've seen, not to downplay, you know, or kind of rise him up, but we've seen both of these, right? We've seen emperors come in and inherit a perfect empire and and bring it to other levels or just be really great stabilizers. But then we've also seen terrible emperors like Commodus comes to mind. He had everything exactly. set up for him. There was yeah. nothing really he had to worry about. And it just kind of went off the cliff because he was not able to, you know, be a great leader in that sense. So I think we say, yeah, he's a, he's got everything that he kind of needs, but it still takes a very good leader to a still be alive and not get overthrown, which is always a challenge, and two to be able to just even keep the status quo is is always 100%. a big challenge. Yeah. yeah, I think it's so easy to say all you have to do is maintain the status quo. Okay, you know that's like that's very short sighted strategic yeah. thinking. Um, steadying the ship and maintaining it on its path is no easy feat, especially when we're talking about the scope and breadth of you know what Montezuma is actually trying to do or what he's in control of at this point. Uh, so in terms of like his military leadership because obviously this is a huge component of Aztec culture and you know his his bio as a whole um so one of his major challenges and i think this is probably true of his entire reign was as an emperor to maintain and extend the vast territories acquired by his predecessor you know he did prove to be a skilled mil military leader so he continued those expansionist policies of his uncle he led numerous successful campaigns extending the boundaries and consolidating Aztec dominance in the region his strategies you know super interesting they were only focused on conquest, but also this kind of duality of maintaining control. So like any empire, you're trying to maintain control over diverse cultures and groups that may not have anything or very little in common with the colonizing forces. So again, this kind of interplay of consolidating, maintaining, but also expanding at the same time. And I think in the same vein, if we look at his administrative and diplomatic skills, you know, he he was able to effectively manage this very complex social, economic, and political structures of the empire. He maintained a vast network of alliances and tributary states. Um, they were crucial, obviously, for the empire's economy and stability. He also understood the importance of religious and cultural practices in Aztec society. And I think there is no way to, you know, undermine the importance that we'll, we'll talk to in a little bit about how deeply these religious and cultural practices are embedded in Aztec society. And essentially, they're also tools for governance, right? And his ability to participate in these ceremonies and rituals to bolster his divine status as emperor are crucial throughout his reign. And I think like any good leader, you know, this is probably just a quick call out, but I think this is just something that we've come across multiple times. But when it comes to good leadership, you know, there's the ability to hold the status quo, there's the ability to kind of expand and maintain and administer properly. But there's also this, you know, idea of improvement and innovation. And, you know, like other leaders that we've discussed, you know, he was, he was able to implement several reforms to kind of strengthen the central control of the empire, but it included, you know, things like reorganizing the military for better efficiency, uh, restructuring the tributary system, enhancing the bureaucracy to be more efficient to manage the affairs of the state. He also focused a lot on infrastructural development. So he was building temples, palaces, and public Public works, which honestly not only showcased the empire's wealth, but they also served very practical purposes in this kind of urban center development and control for the population as a whole. Yeah, and I think you have so many elements too, right? You have you need to show the masses that you're still in control, you still have this power. Then you also need to flatter the other powerful people to to kind of keep them on your side, but also have that element of fear. I'm kind of going almost back to like how Machiavelli was speaking about staying in charge. And I think kind of what Montezuma is doing here, he's kind of got a few of those elements where, you know, we have the the military prowess and the fear mm -hmm. that he brings into not just, you know, people in, in the main city, but also to kind of the outskirts of the empire. Exactly. But then also showing like, hey, look, you're on our team now, or you're part of our empire. Here's all the wonderful things that we have. And, you know, why would you rebel? Why would you join up with another force? Like, sure, you might not like some things, but look at all the, you know, look at all this power that you're, you're kind of contributing to. So again, I think it's, 
you know, Empire 101 once again. Yeah. And I think to that point, just to kind of round this part of the discussion off is that, you know, I've painted a pretty solid picture of his ability to rule and administer. But like any emperor or any empire, there are significant challenges happening at any point in time here. You know, this isn't to say that he's not dealing with skirmishes or tributary states who are trying to break off opposing forces or ex- other external threats. You know, this is part and parcel with any project of empire building. You're always going to be dealing with external threats at some some point or another and i think you know montezuma and the aztec empire is no different for sure yeah and we'll, we'll get to the, <laughs> the if any emperor has had the a larger problem i would like to know about it than, <laughs> you know a civilization five thousand years more advanced than you showing up on your doorstep and being led by a bunch of crazy guys quite frankly yeah so i think it stinks because we know how this story ends because we're yeah. hearing all these great things about montezuma now you start to think well what if this and what if that we can start doing some revisionist history but um yeah i'm sure we'll get into that in a little bit yeah and i think this might be a good point to just kind of pivot the discussion a little bit and i think this is one of the interesting facets of, of this particular discussion when i was one not only doing like the research on montezuma but aztec society as a whole so you know montezuma and i like and his predecessors his uncle his father they kind of fill a very unique unique role. There's a bit of duality here. So he's not only emperor and this, you know, military chieftain and like, you know, who's praised for his military prowess and, and, and leader as a warrior, but he's also a high priest of the Aztec empire, which is kind of emblematic of how deeply intertwined, you know, politics and religion are in these Mesoamerican civilizations. So his governance as a whole, I think it's important to note, wasn't just a matter of like political leadership. It was heavily converged and like you know intertwined with the religious significance and responsibilities that his role placed on upon yeah it kind of gives that divine element to it where i think this is probably a good pivot point to get into when we talk about the aztecs right of you know there are ways where their their religion is so so important to them and there's so many correlations between what the spanish see when it comes to catholicism but there's one one big there's big one massive difference between the two and i think everyone knows where we're going with this and that's the human sacrifice um that the aztecs did so when i i think one of the things we when we think about this is i kind of came into this learning a little bit and seeing like ah oh, this is the spanish talking about how you know they're cutting off twenty thousand heads a day this was just over the top the spanish being you know o- overshooting everything and Sure, they probably weren't doing 20,000 a day. However, from what we've kind of read from a lot of Spanish historians, but also native Mexican historians is the Aztecs did do a lot of human sacrifice. And even though it was common amongst Mayan cultures and other indigenous cultures, it wasn't as widespread as it was with the Aztecs. The Aztecs saw it as this tool and dialed it up to, you know, 11 and were, you know, cutting off a lot of heads and, and sacrificing a lot of people. And so when you read about this, you're like, oh my goodness, you know, you hearing the stories of people being brought to the top of the temple, heads getting cut off, hearts being ripped out, their dead bodies being thrown down the temple, blood everywhere on these sacrificial stones. And it's just an unbelievably harsh and reprehensible thing to think about until you take a step back and look at it from the Aztecs perspective. I think that's maybe the most important thing. And I think the one thing that I read was, you know, if you're an Aztec person, you're not necessarily killing people because you're nuts and you're just like killing people. They legitimately thought that the gods needed their help. The gods needed blood sacrifices. And if they didn't give them blood sacrifices, the world would end. So I think full stop right there. If someone said to you, look, you got to cut off a head every week or the world's going to end and everybody's going to die. All right, we'll we'll cut off a head. Maybe we'll cut off a couple extra ones, like just to be sure, right? Yeah, why not? Yeah, insurance, right? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So it's really, really important to think about this because I think when the Spanish arrive, they're horrified and rightfully so. It is a horrifying thing to think about. But from the Aztecs perspective, there's so many elements to this where they sacrifice people to just keep the world moving, which in their eyes is very, very important. And just think of any cause you have today of, you know, we need to protect the environment or the world will end. Like it's that type of mentality that they have when it comes to human sacrifice. But then there's also a political element to it. Exactly. There's this, you know, we were just talking about how does he keep control of all of these places? Well, sometimes they wouldn't even invade. They would just bring in the leaders from those tribes and be like, hey, why don't you come for a visit and take a look around? Oh, well, well, well it, by coincidence, we're cutting off some heads today. You want to come watch? And they would watch them cut off a bunch of heads and, and do their religious ceremonies. And these guys would go back and be like, yeah, we should probably sign a peace treaty or a patron. <laughs> to the Aztecs because, you know, this is, a little, this is a little messed up. So again, it's it's an essential piece to their to their culture. And it wasn't though 
wholesale, just grabbing people off the street and, and sacrificing them. This was typically chiefs or warriors from rival tribes. And I think it's just quickly, we should get into how kind of their warfare worked was they would show up to warfare and they called them flower wars. They would show up in these bright, beautiful colors and like almost costumes and they would fight. And the winner typically didn't want to kill the enemy. He wanted to wound him or incapacitate him and then drag him back to the main city where he could be sacrificed. And it was seen as like a great honor. There was a lot of respect in saying, you know, I didn't kill you on the battlefield, but I defeated you. And now your your blood is being essentially donated to this process of keeping the world spinning and keeping the world's moving and helping the gods. So it's actually quite a great honor for you, you know, to be sacrificed. And again, as I'm saying it, I'm like, that's just absolutely insane to me. But if we put ourselves in this in the shoes of a typical Aztec person at this time that that makes total sense and I, can you can you justify human sacrifice probably not but I think you can get pretty close to understanding why they would go you know continue this practice until the Spanish arrive yeah I, I can totally I totally agree with that and I think it's probably worthwhile to caveat that the history in motion podcast is not pro human sacrifice <laughs> what we are yes. is pro context and you know pro well established historical analysis and I think when it comes to doing these types of discussions it's very easy to look at a society or region you're not familiar with and point them point to them and say wow look at this other thing that does horrible things to its people but if you open the hood on on any ideologically driven group, any religion, any group that kind of falls in this bucket, and you look deep enough, you're going to find some skeletons in the closet. And I think with the Aztec Empire, really, it's it's so context driven. You know, they are such a deeply religious people, their belief in their God. Like if we look back at Montezuma's role as high priest, so not only is he, you know, the emperor, which is overseeing the daily operations and public works, not only is he, is he a military leader, but as a high priest, he's in charge of overseeing these religious ceremonies and rituals. And the reason he's doing this, you know, at least from the perspective of his followers or the population within the empire, is that he's trying to maintain a cosmic order and appease the gods. And his position as as a high priest, you know, gives him kind of divine status among his people, elevating to this, elevating him to almost like a godlike figure. And again, not to draw too many comparisons between, you know, Europe uh, or the Western world and, you know, what we've talked about before. But again, that kind of reads to me like the divine right of kings in some way, shape mm, or form. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way to look at it. And again, it's a, just another tool in his tool belt to keep control. Exactly. Right. Yep. I'm kind of like a god, maybe not a god, but pretty close to a god. And I'm doing all of these things to make sure the world doesn't end. You know, you should, you know, what are you going to do? Right. It's it's just again, it's it's hard to wrap your head around. Around, but I think it's so, so important that we kind of, you know, sit on this and think of, yeah, that's just their worldview. And it's the stakes are just so high that it kind of makes sense. And it, it's one of those things where it would we say it would be weird if Montezuma was in charge and he had all and there was nothing that he was really doing to stay in charge. It's, it always is the other exactly. way. It's like, of course, he's yeah. in charge. Here's all the yeah. things he's doing, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting piece. And there's just one thing I wanted to get into here just about the Aztec religion that I thought was pretty interesting, and it's about their gods. So they have a variety of different gods, but one of them, basically, I don't even really know the best way to describe it other than they talk about that he would walk around with flayed skin, like human skin. That is how he yes. was depicted. And there was a festival every year where some of these high priests would walk around with skin, like human human skin and walk around for I think it was 20 days or 30 days and just walk around kind of with all this flayed skin on them. And again, to us, that's horrifying. But to them, it was normal because it was honoring this God who has made sacrifices for them and all these sort of things. And so to them, it, it kind of makes sense. But again, it's just that blood and kind of human sacrifice element is just ingrained in everything they do. And to take it away is to really take away the, the essence of the religious elements of the Aztecs. Yeah. And I think it's an exercise of just like, again, you know, I always go back to context and I think that's something that we try to do our best at in our episodes is just to provide as much context as possible. We're not trying to paint a picture here that is, you know, leaning one way or the next. We're trying to be very objective. And I think, you know, again, this is very different than a lot of the content that we've created previously because, you know, we having grown up in Canada, Canadian history, European history, that's what we grew up with. We didn't spend a lot of time learning about South American or Mesoamerican history. 
industry. So I can see how this would be very, you know, potentially jarring or very different than what we're seeing. But again, in the context of it, this is like the theocratic nature and like the deeply religious sentiments that underpin, you know, most of the Aztec society that we're talking about. Yeah, I think 100 percent. And you can, I guess, a little bit of foreshadowing here is, you know, we're, we'll get into, I think probably now is a good time to start talking okay. about the Spanish arrival, but you can see why we come from a Western Christian kind of society and we're horrified by this. Can you imagine people who are 10 times more religious than the two of us <laughs> yeah. showing up and seeing all of these kind of things? It, it must have been just an, a horrifying experience for, you know, Cortez and, and all the other Spanish conquistadors. Yeah, I think I think one of the things, and obviously we can see the direction that this is going now, these first point of contact stories, right? It's so hard to wrap your head around. You know, if you look at it from both perspectives, right now we're talking about the Aztecs and Montezuma, and obviously Montezuma is a, is a key player in, in what's about to happen. Given his very dynamic role within society, he's not just a emperor, he's a military leader. He's also the high priest. So this kind of, you know, duality that he covers obviously sets him up to play a very unique uh, role in what what's going to eventually play out with first conquest with uh, with Cortez at the end of the day. And could you imagine, you know, your worldview just changing drastically in a matter of you know a few hours once first contact is made to now realize that your world is much bigger than you ever thought it was versus where it was you know twenty four hours before that. That's the part that always kind of blows mm-hmm. my mind. Yeah, and it's. You know, we get to the point where Cortez shows up to the city and he's able to see all these things, but he's getting, he has a very vast spy network and intelligence service as well to him. And he's hearing about these lighter skinned, reddish haired men showing up on the coast in their giant wood buildings that can float because the Aztecs have canoes. They don't have massive ships with sails there. He's hearing stories of these men riding these riding deer. They said that were three to four times larger than a deer because they've never seen a horse before. Right. So can you imagine you're hearing these stories going, there's a what there's a who now that must be some crazy, you know, chief somewhere trying to throw me off the scent. And then he's getting more reports and more reports and more reports. And then, you know, there's a knock at the front door and hi, my name's Cortez. And here's my men with steel swords and guns and cannons and these massive deer. Can we, you know, can we come in and, and say hello? Like, could you just imagine the, the worldview of that? And we talked about it a little bit at the beginning was this is like a science fiction movie. This is like yep. an alien civilization showing up with technology that's way more advanced than you have. For example, like we look at steel versus like, I don't even think they had bronze yet. They used um, obsidian, which is like a volcanic mm-hmm. rock. So it's very, very brittle. So if a steel sword and an obsidian sword come together, the obsidian sword is shattering into pieces. Shattering. And yep. So, you know, one conquistador versus 10 or 15 Aztec warriors, you probably pick the conquistador just because he's able to essentially hack through them, them quite easily. But what a worldview, right? It's you, the only way you can put yourself into the Aztec shoes is what if a flying saucer, you know, rolled into to Washington, D.C. or into Ottawa or into London yep. or one of these big cities and, you know, look, people look completely different. They're riding these animals that are 10 times bigger than we've ever seen. That's the, I think that's the only way you can look at it. Yeah, it gives me goosebumps thinking about because it, it would be such a game changer. Yeah, and then I think like, what do you do, right? Do you, what's your first response is, okay, we should kill them, but wait. <laughs> <laughs> that's, usually, that's usually the first human response. <laughs> it is, and then you think, okay, well, hold on. There's only a few hundred of them. That means there's probably more of them. We really don't want to annoy the ones that have come in and kill them. But then at the same time, if we let them in and show them around too much, maybe they're going to call home and say, hey, there's maybe some some precious minerals here. And in the Aztecs case, Hey, look, there's gold everywhere. Yeah. Give me some of that. Right. So it's, it's a really good parallel, but again, what do you do if you're Montezuma at this point, these guys show up and do you kill them? Do you bring them in? There's a, there's a lot of different ways you could have taken it, but you know, I don't think, I think the end would have always been the same. Yeah. hundred percent. Cause I think it's in, in 1519, right? That's when Hernan Cortez and a group of Spanish conquistadors essentially land on the coast in what is now Mexico. And we've touched on it before, but like just to reiterate for the listeners. So, you know, why does anyone go on a mission to the other side of the world? There's got to be some motivation. And the motivation here, like many of these motivations, when we, if we look back to like Columbus, you know, it's a story of vast riches, gold and other treasures that, you know, explorers want to go conquer. And then, you know, there's always this kind of subtext of conversion of the indigenous populations to Christianity to be able to 
one, spread the, you know, spread the Christian message, but also, you know, find some wealth and some resources that could be flown back to kind of to, to Europe and, and to Spain to help, you know, the Spanish Empire and the monarchy there kind of, you know, grow and advance as much as they can. Yeah. And I think we have to go back to our episodes when we talked about Columbus and, and Queen Isabella and remember that Spain has just, just been unified. This is a very new state. It's trying to stamp its claim on the world. And to do so, you need a lot of money and you need a lot of power. But at the heart of all of this is Catholicism and Christianity and this obsession with having everybody become Catholic. And thus, if you become Catholic, you're you're on our team and, and you yep. know, way to go. So like I kind of mentioned earlier in the podcast, every time the as they say the uh, the Spanish show up, they're giving these great speeches about God and how great everything is about um, about Catholicism. The Aztecs are kind of going, "All right, w- w- we get it. You you love your gods," and that's like the first thing that the Aztecs <laughs> really realize about these guys is they love their God. They're always praying. They're always talking about him. And so again, we always talk about how important religion is, and especially when the Spanish case, you know, they're trying to you know, get rich and all of these things from Cortez's perspective. But the Spanish crown at the end of the day is spreading Catholicism is the most important thing. And that's always the you know number one order is find a way to convert the indigenous population to Catholicism, sometimes very nicely, sometimes not so nicely. Yep. But that's the main goal on top of if you can get rich in the process, that's that'll also be good too. Yeah, 100%. And I think it, there's always that duality, right? It's easy to kind of underpin this this uh this converting mission that you know Europe is is kind of going forward with but ultimately you know someone's got to pay the bills these these conquesting missions are not cheap to fund you know masses of ships and masses of men to to cross the atlantic into a world where they've never been to you know explore and discover these treasures so you know money ultimately is is kind of the bottom line that they're driving towards as well so we can look at montezuma's initial response to this cuz i think this is obviously you know, such an interesting aspect of this discussion. If we're looking, you know, with the arrival of Cortes and the Spanish conquistadors, I imagine, and this is probably largely an inference as many historians have probably made up to this point, is there's probably a mix of curiosity, caution, fear, and ultimately, you know, what would be some diplomatic maneuvering, right? There's several factors influencing his, his decision making at this point. Um, one, there's this kind of religious undertone to it, which is quite interesting. Um, so there's prophecies that kind of underpin the Aztec community, uh, which is the return of uh, Quetzalcoatl which is a feathered serpent deity. And, you know, this may have played a role in this kind of diplomatic maneuvering because the Spaniards' arrival actually coincided with the predicted year of the deity's return. So Montezuma potentially could have considered Cortes as a fulfillment of this prophecy, leading to, you know, this, uh, you know, a degree of hesitation and reverence in how he's going to maneuver this initial contact with Cortez. Yeah, I think he's trying. He's got to feel this guy out, right? He needs to know what, again, like you said, that that religious element is huge. He's thinking, did the gods send in these, you know, these men who are, you know, so much more advanced and is it a gift for us to use against our enemies or are they here to destroy us or are they something else completely? And there's many more of them to come. You know, which, which direction am I going to go take here? And I can only imagine what's going on through his head because how, how would he know that there is this massive empire called Spain across the ocean that's got many, many more people who are going to be landing on his doorstep very soon? Yep. But, you know, there's a million things going through his head at this point. And I think, you know, he plays it safe for the most part, you know, um, prior to his arrival Cortez's arrival in, in Tenochtitlan, there are exchanges of envoys between Montezuma and Cortez. Montezuma sends gifts. It includes gold, fine crafts, possibly as like, you know, a display of advancement or strength to appease the newcomers. For Cortez, this obviously is like the green light. You know, to him, I can imagine, like, okay, yep, this is the right place. <laughs> uh, we made the right move. And this, you know, more or less probably fueled his determination to reach the city and actually confirm the existence of, you know, the wealth and gold that they're seeking out. And ultimately, he does get there, right? Um, he's allowed into Tenochtitlan uh, along with his men. And perhaps this is an exercise of underestimation of the threat that they posed as they're trying to kind of maintain diplomacy. And this decision was a critical one as it gave the Spanish strategic advantage. You know, the Spaniards obviously were astounded by the city's grandeur and wealth that I think we've done a 
you know, decent job at, you know, communicating to the listeners, but, you know, it's a double-edged sword. So not only have they confirmed the wealth and resources that are available, now they see the scale of what's happening here. And, you know, I think it's a safe assumption or inference that this only motivates their imperial ambitions at this point. And shortly after their arrival, you know, those imperial ambitions kind of take hold and they start to manifest and the Spaniards take Montezuma hostage and they effectively start controlling the Aztec empire through him. And this is kind of a period of captivity, which is kind of marked again by this complex interplay between Montezuma, Cortes, and other Aztec nobility. So as Montezuma continues his role in a limited capacity, he's essentially under the influence and direction of Cortes at the same time. Yeah, it's a uh... It's an interesting kind of story that kind of leads up to all of that. And, and you, th- it starts out, you know, Montezuma, like we were saying, he's just feeling him out. He's, he invites Cortez and, and his men into the city and he treats them like guests slash semi prisoners in a sense. But then on top of that, he's, I think he's starting to figure out who these guys are and he's realizing like there's a story where they're playing some Aztec game. And the Spanish are just cheating the whole time. And Montezuma was like, I can, I know you guys are cheating. And you can kind of see the mentality of these guys of they're maybe not the brightest guys in the world. They're very selfish and driven by the fact that they're only here to get rich because yep. like we talked about, you have to think of the mentality of the guy who's going to get on a boat and then walk through jungle for potentially months <laughs> to find the promise of gold, which may or may not even exist. Exactly. And so you get stories of the conquistadors just ransacking random areas is in the palace just stealing stuff doing whatever they want and at this point you know montezuma i think probably realizes that okay i gotta do something with these guys and there's a lot of rumors floating around that there's a big ceremony coming up and you know wouldn't it be great wouldn't the (laughs) gods be really happy if we were able to sacrifice these great men who have just showed up on our doorstep that are nothing like we've ever sacrificed before you know that may have been rumors that was going on there may have been a bunch of other things but again this the spanish are at a point now where panic comes into play and kidnapping and, and trying to control the area through Montezuma is probably the right thing to do for them. But again, you have a city of 200,000 people plus a million in the surrounding area. At what point do they start to say, hey, um, you know, have you seen Montezuma lately? He's in the castle with the Spanish guys and he's <laughs> hasn't really seems to be coming out. Is, does anybody know what's up? It's, it's, it's a strategy in the sense of it saves your own skin, but now you're trapped in a city with 200,000 people who are ready to take their emperor back at some point. Yeah, no, exactly. I wonder how it would have played out in other circumstances. And we're not in the business of revisionist history, but, you know, to your point, how many men did Cortes have with him? Like, there's no, well, obviously, you know, there's reinforcements coming. I'm sure there's, you know, more reinforcements on the way, but you're in the middle of one of the largest cities in the world at this point in time with highly trained warriors. <laughs> uh, maybe you have, you know, the technological advancements in your in your back pocket, but, you know, I'm sure it's a numbers game at, 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 a, at a certain point. And you're on a kind of an island too, right? Yeah, there's only yeah, exactly. one or, there's only, it's like a few bridges out of town and that's it. And where do you think the Aztecs are going to set up shop? They're going to burn them down or they're going to stick their best warriors on there and say, all right, well, this is the way out. And then, and also too, Cortez and these guys, they're, they're not walking out of there empty handed. They're going to try to bring as much gold and a bunch of other stuff as they can, I'm sure. So this is not, and they're going to have to figure out, do they try to fight their way out? Do they walk their way out? And, and what do they do with Montezuma? He's a captive. Do they execute him? Do they try to bring them along? Like, you know, what kind of happens here? And then what are the Aztec people thinking too? Do they think Montezuma exactly. sold out, maybe, yep. right? And there's probably so many rumors going on through the city that nobody really knows um, what's going on inside that palace outside of the people who are, who are physically there. Yeah, I think that's such a good point, right? And I think, you know, as we're rounding up the hour on this particular episode, I think it's, at least from my mind, at this point in time with the Spanish conquistadors in Tenochtitlan and Montezuma kind of being held captive within the city by the conquistadors, he is in effect a puppet leader at this point you know he's interacting with his people on behalf of spanish uh, on behalf of the spanish and more or less on behalf of you know their ambitions and goals making decisions and declarations that were often against his and his people's interests you know this included things like ordering his subjects to comply with the spanish even assisting the spanish with efforts to loot aztec treasures obviously this is going to erode his standing and credibility among the aztec people ultimately and then you know the spanish motive as we've discussed already they want to obviously maintain control over him the city without doing much and you know they're able to do that by being able to hold uh, montezuma hostage downfall 
or the downside of this strategy is that eventually you're going to create a powder keg, <laughs> which is a extremely volatile environment where Montezuma and you know what they're obviously going to assume is the people that are actually in control, which is these you know new foreigners that have come from you know across the ocean are going to start being resented by the Aztecs, which is going to lead to you know increasing and growing unrest and anger from the rest of the populace. Yeah, and I think one thing with Montezuma too is I've read that you know, he was this great leader. Then he's taken captive, and you see this just sudden change in Montezuma from great powerful leader who doesn't take any any garbage from anybody to a man who's almost in a deep depression, some have said. And I, I think the way that some historians have looked at it is, you know, they're putting two and two together because we don't know, but almost saying that he's realized what the Spanish are. He realizes that yep. this is just a small sampling of what's to come and it almost comes to grips with this is the end of the Aztecs forever he just kind of says look we need to either work with these guys is probably what he's thinking or just try to find a way to keep his people alive and telling them not to fight back because he knows at the end of the day that if the spanish actually want to take over they'll take over quite easily just based on how powerful these guys are and again having cortez there is not probably the best example of, of what spain represents but yeah. again it's the level that they would go to. So I think it's, you know, Montezuma, I think kind of has gone through peaks and valleys of how he's recognized in history. But like, again, I put myself in his shoes and again, aliens take me hostage and they're like, look, we got ray guns and stuff that can destroy a city. What am I going to really do? Right. I say, yeah, fight back and have all my people get killed. It's, it's an impossible place to be in. And I've got, I've, I've never felt, I think more for a leader in, in our series here of doing all these episodes, because there's really no right answer or any answer that no. can bring him out of the reckoning that's about to come. And again, sure, the Spanish are terrifying, but he doesn't even know that they've brought smallpox into his city. That's going to exactly. kill more people than the Spanish can even count, right? Yeah, it's a chilling realization. And I think, so I guess just to kind of tie off this episode, right? There's like the rebellion and, and this death that kind of, I think would act as like a good demarcation line for us. But so it's in 1520, essentially tensions at this point have reached a breaking point and it leads to an uprising in the city. The exact circumstances around Montezuma's death during the rebellion are kind of shrouded in mystery and controversy. Some people believe it was his own people that killed him, possibly that he was stoned to death um, because he was perceived as too compliant or complicit with the Spanish. Other accounts suggest that the Aztecs, outraged by his kind of subservience, are ultimately the ones that acted against him. Some historians, uh, I think, in, more, in the more modern era, I believe it was the Spanish who were responsible for Montezuma's death. And according to this view, you know, he was murdered by the Spanish as he was no longer useful as a puppet leader. And to prevent him from actually become a rallying point for the Aztec resistance, thought it would be easier just to, you know, get rid of him right off the hop. Yeah. And I think it goes down to whose who's narrative are you you're really looking at here? And yeah. Yeah, if, yeah, you've heard the stories of, oh, he was, you know, the Aztecs were throwing stones at us and one hit Montezuma and he bled to death or he was stabbed or, you know, there's, we'll never know for sure. But again, it's a, a terrible situation with a lot of violence and, you know, a lot of people were going to die. And unfortunately for Montezuma, that's kind of the end of his story, which kind of sucks because I think so much more happens um, in that time. And, you know, he doesn't really die that hero's death or he doesn't die in battle. No, he, he doesn't, doesn't die in his bed. He dies in a dungeon or he dies on a rooftop being hit by a rock by his own people. Either way, it's, it's a sad, sad end to, um, to his life. And, you know, I just one thing I wanted to touch on is, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, who's, who's telling this story. And yep. there's a weird spot here where the Aztec people and the Spanish almost have a similar narrative they want to tell. We'll kind of just go back a little bit to when Cortez and Montezuma meet. Cortez writes that when he meets Montezuma, he says, Montezuma just gave the empire up to me. He said, it's yours, your gods have the empire. Of course. And, you know, that was the narrative for hundreds of years was that the Aztecs were just overwhelmed by these Spaniards and gave up the land. And so the reason Cortez writes that is because the Spanish have this very strict legal code where they don't actually come in and think that it's you can just take over indigenous land. You can't just steamroll your way in and take what you want. You need to have a legal right to the land. And so part of it is, hey, you know, you convert them to Christianity and you marry in and all that kind of stuff. But the, the Aztec people, like this daughter of Montezuma and people who are part of Montezuma's family, also double down on that narrative to say, well, look, it was our land that we gave to, to Cortez and, and we have a legal right to that. And some of them actually are able to go back to Spain and argue their case 
and say, hey, actually, this was our legal land and it belongs to us for all these sort of reasons. So there is that narrative there. So it's kind of for everything we've said, we have to really you know think about who's kind of writing that narrative. And it's been very Spanish versus Aztec. But this is an interesting spot where I think both are kind of on the same page of having Montezuma come off as this submissive kind of leader who just gave up and gave everything to the Spanish. I'm doing air quotes legal sense versus it was actually just chaos and he died by whatever circumstances he died and the rest kind of just happened as it did is another piece of, you know, who's writing this history and what's their ultimate motive. Yeah, he almost comes off or ultimately kind of finishes his life as this kind of tragic figure, right? And I go back to your point about that potentially chilling realization that, you know, I'm confident he probably thought something along those lines that like, this is just a taste of what's coming down the pipe. Like this is going to get a lot worse pretty fast. And how can I maintain peace for as long as possible to protect my people? Absolutely. He's doing what any great leader should do and thinking through yeah. all the potential scenarios. He's having the foresight. We've talked about this a million yeah. times, right? Having yeah. that foresight, but sometimes foresight leads you down the same dark and scary path. And, you know, I don't know what he's supposed to do. I don't think there's anything he can do. And no. like we said, add smallpox on top of this, which is the worst of everything that's coming, which was going to come in some capacity anyways. But now you have to deal with Cortez and you have to deal with not only Cortez, but you also have to deal with this rallying cry of all of the indigenous tribes in the area and these other peoples that have been at your throat for generations saying, you know, getting this newfound confidence of, you know, hey, the Spanish are here and we can team up with them and, and kick the Aztecs, but let's do it. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, if it's I think it is. It's just so tragic. The, yeah. And I think you put it the best way of that. It's just a sad end to, a, you know, a great life of, a, of someone who you know really had the opportunity to take this empire to you know another level and again though a lot of blood a lot of sacrifice all that stuff would come as part of it but you know i don't know there's a maybe a i'm not sure where i can even kind of put the right word for it but you don't want to see any of these leaders just kind of die in some sort of skirmish you, you want to have almost that like storybook ending of died in bed as an old man or died in battle or you know something with a little bit more nobleness to it but here we are history isn't always a, a storybook ending unfortunately no, sadly not yeah so i think to wrap up you know we've talked at length about montezuma we've mentioned cortez a lot so far but there's a lot more to this story that we're going to talk about next time which i think i'm really excited for we'll, we'll see where cortez comes from as a person we'll see who he is and you know we ended this story with the conquistadors trapped in in the main aztec city with a dead montezuma and a, and a enraged populace they have to find a way to get out somehow and and they find a way and it's it's a very, very interesting and kind of crazy story. So um, definitely looking forward to coming back and chatting more about this. Yeah. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the History in Motion podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through time, please subscribe, rate us and share the podcast with friends. Your support helps keep history alive. Until next time.